Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another grayscalegorilla.com podcast. We stopped saying .com a few episodes ago, I feel like. I, I don't I, think anybody ever types in .com, though. They, they just type into their task bar, and it autofills. I, I'm pretty sure everybody who listens to this podcast knows that it's a web. We have a website too, so I I don't know. Maybe it's kind of overkill. Anyway, maybe never never assume. Never assume. I'm Chad Ashley. We've got Chris Schmidt with us. Hello, hello. And noticeably absent is our man Nick Campbell. He couldn't make it today. He's uh, taking a little trip. So, what's up? We're Nick? gonna do we're, it anyway. Let's yeah, do we're, this. we're gonna do it. And not only we're doing it, but we're we're doing it um, live doing and live. very live. limited live. Right. It's uh, this is a live podcast streaming uh, exclusively um, to our GSG Connect members. Those of you that don't know what GSG Connect is, GSG Connect is our uh, internal kind of customer Slack that you get access to if you're a Grayscale, Grayscale Gorilla customer. You'll get access to this Slack channel where you can talk with other Grayscale Gorilla customers and talk with us and get uh, exclusive access to content and cool things like this. Now, this will be a regular podcast, but we are going to be doing more of an AMA style. So we're going to be um, looking at the chat in uh, in the window. That's, that's if you're on GSG Connect right now, if you're not for listening at home, people are asking us questions and we're going to be answering them. So uh, yeah, we can yeah. catch up on some news, but for everybody who's actively in the chat right now, start putting your questions. And when I see a good one, because we're going to get to them in a second, I'm going to copy it and paste it so that I can then kind of ask it again properly. Oh, good. So I'm, all glad, question. I'm glad you're a pro at this because you, you do it every week, basically. Yep. Um, anyway, so news. What do we got for news? Uh, we had our big sale. That was actually, what was that, a week ago? Two weeks ago? Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday. So that is um, under, uh, has come and gone, and it was a huge success. Thank you to everybody that uh, took part in the sale, and thank you to all the new customers. A lot of new customers uh, came in, and we see them popping up on GSG Connect on the Slack. It's great to see them, so welcome. Um, we got all kinds of things that we're developing behind the scenes. This next couple months are going to be very busy for the development team, myself, uh, working on all kinds of cool new stuff that we can't really talk about quite yet. Um, you got any other news, Chris? Hmm, news. That's no, uh, nothing. Nothing I can talk about publicly. <laughs> we I got lots it. of fun stuff yeah. <laughs> cooking in the background, but I know. And it's like ah, I want to talk about it, but I know there's lots of. Well, I mean, we we do have some. Um, we do have. We did show some really interesting things. Uh, during our sale, we did a couple of streaming videos that, that we got to find a way to get those out to our GSG Connect members because we did show off some cool new features that I don't, I think that's pretty much public, right? The signal update is oh, yeah. pretty much it, a not, publicly known thing. Yeah. I've been constantly showing off and Ask GSG episodes. Uh, so it is available online if you know the right places to look, but we haven't made a big deal and we haven't really like tweeted anything out specifically. Right. So what it what what is that? What for those of us for those people listening uh, that maybe didn't watch the streams? What is new in Signal? Really quickly, let's just give a quick overview. Well, I think we might have mentioned some of the stuff before. Did the uh, the big thing, of course, is beats per minute BPM. It's a big Signal BPM update. So it's a new tab, a new whole modifier type inside of Signal, and. Instead of doing any kind of complicated like sound analysis, you just go and you figure out the BPM of your song, the beats per minute, and then you can now use that as a way of of triggering a spline animation, essentially. You can go and draw whatever spline shape you want, and that motion will happen on any parameter in Cinema 4D. And you can map that on. But the really fun part is that there's we built a little sequencer. And the sequencer can be broken up into up to 16 parts. Um, but I think mostly people work in like quads. So you can map different splines onto different parts of a sequence and have them trigger at certain times and just kind of drive any parameter. But you have all the amazing like parametric layering up repetition options that you would get in, in any of our old or in any of the original signal tabs like noise and whatnot, things where you can loop and offset and make multiple duplicates of it and make a copy of the tag and drive multiple other things. Lots and lots of different ways of uh, of setting those things up and just driving so many cool little features. And then uh, as a secondary thing, we also added in Quantize. 
So yeah, you guys should be able to see in the screen if you're watching it on YouTube, that you can actually see the layout Chad's got up there and you can see the sequencer. Yeah, this is a this is such an awesome update, and I'm really excited to see what people do with it. And I'm just sharing my screen uh, for those of you at home. I won't do this um, throughout the entire show because I, I can imagine that would get pretty annoying if we start referring to stuff that we're uh, showing, but you can't see because you're listening to it. So yeah, um, it's a really cool feature. Um, I'm excited to see what all the VJs out there do with it. Uh, yeah, so that that should be cool. And then we also added in a tiny uh, quantize feature, the ability to like snap the values to time or snap the values to a certain percentage change of its value. Um, so that's a, that's a little bonus feature thrown in there. That's like, okay, we need this. I can think of a bunch of places it would be fun. So yeah, that's super useful. I, I start messing around with that, doing like stop motion effects. And it, it's really cool to kind of get that every third frame, every fifth frame kind of look. Um, it's it's super rad. I'm excited to see or so excited to do more with that myself. Um, anyway, so uh, what else we got? Um, Any render wars? Oh it's boy, a quiet the on render that front. wars continues. Um, not nothing crazy. Uh, there's been. Um, I think there was a. I think there were some updates to Octane, or maybe I'm wrong. Actually, maybe there wasn't any new op updates to Octane. I don't know. I've, my, my head has been like buried in Substance and learning Substance and playing with that, and I've just been kind of like diving headfirst into that world, which has been a ton of fun. And yeah, that was me a month and a half ago. Yeah, it's so it's much Substance. It's addictive. It's super addictive. But yeah, not really much going on uh, in that in that side. Um, Redshift still in alpha, waiting for some updates there. Uh, Arnold, of course, I'm still really digging the new Arnold Five and the new Arnold Five features. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I think. That, oh yeah, somebody some sort of survey or something recently. Oh yes. Um, Is that something people should go? Yeah. Really, we should put a link to or something. Yeah, I put. Um, if you if you're listening uh, and you're on GSG Connect, you have access to our polls. We have a polls channel, and in there, there's a channel that is helping me understand what all of you are using to render, um, without giving too much away about what we're what we have in development. But we need to kind of make sure we're developing stuff that's going to be useful for the people that are for the most ubiquitous kind of rendering platform so it's important for us to know like what your what our customers are using to render so hit that polls channel if you're in gsg connect and vote i think it's like you have to scroll up a little bit to get to it because it's um the unfortunate thing about slack is if conversations happen then stuff starts to like drift upwards so go uh cast your vote if you haven't already um all right enough of this let's get into some questions um let's see what do we got here chris did you find any right off the bat that that we should, uh, oh, thank you, Mark, new Oct Octane Bench. That's what I was thinking. Um, in terms of Render Wars update, there's a new Octane Bench uh, a, that essentially will measure your GPU's uh, speed. So, so it's like Cinebench, but for... Uh... For, for Octane, yeah. There, it's a new one for the 3.06 update. So that's um, that's kind of cool. And it's got full the full Pascal... Uh, support, so you can go check that out if you want to test your stuff. As as a side note, something that is endlessly entertaining to me is that there are so many people who have probably used the Cinema 4D, mm. um, like what? Wait, Cinebench. Like Cinebench is like the number two thing in the world for testing out like your overall computer power, which is crazy. That it's like oh, like and it, it's not new. Like it was super old, and then they made one update to it. And it's still like the best way of being like, okay, let's just throw all of my computer's power at this thing and see what numbers it gives me. Like, yeah. That's pretty much all there is. Like, I don't know. Before if it's I even best. used Cin before I even used Cinema 4D, I knew what Cinebench was and I had no idea that the two were connected. I just thought Cinebench was like a standard uh, measurement for speed or something. Like I didn't even know. And it wasn't until I watched someone do it and I noticed that the font was the same and it looked like the renderer and everything. I was like, oh my God, they, they make that? Like that's so crazy. Like that's, you're right. That's like, that's like the standard test when you want to uh, see, you know, your all your CPUs working on something and getting a score for your CPUs. It's like, it's crazy. It's, it's weird. Crazy. 
Anyway, uh, but yeah, we um, got some questions. We got right. one from Mike, and he's asking, "How would you go about transitioning an intern to learn a different three D package or a renderer?" They will be mentoring somebody who knows Maya and V-Ray and bring them over to Cinema 4D and Octane. And it's also their first time mentoring. Mm. Okay. I've had this, I've switched many artists over from Maya to 3ds Max and from 3ds Max over to Cinema. But you seem like the person to talk to. I've definitely done it. And Except um, you're skipping the middle point here. You're, you're, all your advice will have to be, okay, yeah. first you got to teach him Max, and then you yeah. teach him... Well, what did they say they know already? What are they, where they know looking? Maya and V-Ray. Okay. They're going well, to C4D and Octane. Um, if, if they know Maya and they know V-Ray, I think the hardest thing for people to understand when coming from Maya into Cinema 4D is just the overall... Uh, difference in how the applications work. And it, it, they're similar in some respects and completely different in other respects. Like the object manager is totally different than the object lister in, in Maya. So I would say have them um, essentially start to do a real broad stroke one-to-one. -one. Like what is, I use this in Maya, what is that called in cinema? And start to make these really broad stroke connections between what they're used to and what they what what they're doing in cinema. Don't try to like, you know, tell them sit in cinema and just click on every button because that's not really that's like jumping into a language without really knowing the foundation of how how to speak. So if you know how you do how you approach something in Maya, kind of break it down and have them break it down in their head. Uh, whether it's modeling or animation or lighting, whatever, like break it down in their head how they would approach it in Maya and then take each one of those steps and find the equivalent in cinema. And then just, it, it's going to happen through repetition. They're just going to have to be in cinema all the time. Uh, as far as like going from V-Ray to Octane, that'll be much easier. Um, there's less knobs to fiddle with in Octane. So that'll be a non-starter that once they understand kind of the basics of how octane operates versus v-ray that won't be an issue the issue will be um getting them to understand how uh cinema differs in the way that it functions the way that it models the way that it you select things the way that you manipulate objects all those types of things you'll have to just kind of map out the one-to-one -one from maya but it, it, have both of the apps up i think that's probably really important i think let them bring Maya to the studio. Having it up while they're in cinema is helpful so that they can quickly kind of jump back and forth and say, okay, this is how I would do it here. Now let me go try to do it there. I, I don't know this, but I'll bet you anything that somewhere online, somebody has a Cinema 4D layout saved where they made it look as much like Maya as possible. So you could probably even get a layout that's like, okay, I, I'm getting familiar with this and then transition into full Cinema 4D. Uh, just yeah. like so, someone in the chat, uh, there's Jake is mentioning that they uh, found it helpful to map their Cinema 4D keys to Maya's shortcuts, and that sounds like it'd be a fun way. If you're if there's like those ten commands you're doing over and over and over again, like to map those, I would recommend that after you've gotten comfortable in in the new application, to fully transition into like its default shortcuts and whatnot. Uh, because otherwise, every time a new version comes out, every time you're behind a different machine, every time someone's behind your machine doing something things aren't the way it's expected to be. So, mm -hmm. but as a, as a little, like a little pick me up in the in-between, that seems useful. Yeah, definitely. That'll help you learn. I I've, I'm still using hotkeys that I migrated from Maya and max into cinema Spacebar for maximizing viewports, the QER uh, for, you know, select rotation, translate all that stuff. I, I tend to use a lot of my old uh, hotkeys from those days just because of the muscle memory. And I regret it a little bit. I regret not having just cut the cord and learned cinema's hotkeys. Uh, I'm slowly starting to do that now because you're right. I think it, it becomes a lot harder to follow along with tutorials and, and things when someone is like you, like you're really good about when you're, when you're doing tutorials, you call out the hotkeys that you're doing but I've remapped so many of mine that a lot of that just doesn't mean anything to me anymore. So I have to like go in and either remap them again or go revert back to the default. But yeah, it's a good way to kind of, it's a good band-aid solution. So it doesn't feel like you're um, 
walking in mud and you can't like get anywhere like it, it'll be a little bit easier if the things that you're used to are where you where you uh like them yeah I, I don't jump around a lot of different software packages but you know a month and a half ago when i was playing a bunch with substance um because you're in this node editor every time i jump into espresso i'm expecting I, I my brain was already like transitioning into substance shortcuts and i really like a lot of their workflow with the way the wires reconnect and whatnot mm -hmm. and it's like eh, it's like oh nope can't do that like gotta do it this way okay so yeah, i that... can definitely see um almost for the first time well the first times of like oh wait uh, doing this kind of transition can be a little bit difficult yeah it's uh it's weird man like so many there, there's a lot of programs i think like my Max and um, Cinema, they have some things that are completely kind of similar in, in how they work. And then there's some things that are completely, completely different. And nodes, I think, are one of those things that I wish all the 3D packages would just like get together and say, here's how we're going to, you know, let's come up with a standardized way to deal with nodes. Uh, because it seems like every program is different. And... Uh, especially with like killing connections, like I just wish there was a standard way to kill connections in every app that uses nodes. Anyway, um, yeah. man, we've got a lot of questions piling up here. Let's yeah, so I've got I got another Chad specific one from Tokyo Megaplex, and he's asking, oh, up, they, or they are asking. I don't know if it's, a, I don't know. Uh, well, anyway, uh, I, uh, they said they're really curious why you left Maya and then went to Max and then came around to Cinema 4D. Plus more details about those transitions. Yeah. Uh, well, that's a long story, but I'll try to make it real short. Yeah, do the short version. Yeah, the um, started in Maya because that's really all there was at the time. It was Alias Wavefront, um, and then it, then I went into Maya, and Maya was like, you know, the the gold standard of 3D apps, and it was used in movies and all this stuff. So everybody thought they needed it, and. I never really liked it all that much, to be honest. I was in it, and I thought it was awesome until I realized it wasn't, and I just wasn't... I was a one-man department. It was really hard to get stuff done. So a friend of mine got a job at Discrete Logic, which used to own 3ds Max for a period of time, and he said, hey, I work at uh, Discrete Logic. You should check out 3ds Max. We have this 3D program. It's way easier than mine. I think you'll dig it. And so he's like, gives me a free copy of it. And I started playing with it. And I was able to do everything that I would needed to do much faster and easier using 3ds Max. So I started using that. And I completely became obsessed with 3ds Max and the original kind of default version of V-Ray, not the Cinema 4D edition of V-Ray. And that became my go-to tools for a decade. And I taught a lot of people how to use 3ds Max that worked at DK and all and all that sort of thing. Um, and then um, Autodesk bought 3ds Max and slowly but surely started to choke the life out of it. And a lot uh, fewer and fewer artists started coming up learning it. Couldn't find freelancers that knew it. Couldn't find um, hardly anyone that knew it. Um, 3ds Max became kind of synonymous with two different industries, architectural visualization and uh, TV VFX. And we were doing motion design, which was somewhere in between those. And it was really hard to find artists. At that same time, cinema was starting to blow up in terms of popularity, a lot of people learning it. R17 brought a lot of features that I was excited by. R18 did even more cool stuff to make it more pro ready, in my opinion. Uh, so uh, around that time, I kind of succumbed and said, okay, you know what, I'm going to try Cinema 4D, see what it's like, see if it's got everything that I need to do my job. And it did. And uh, mainly, the big factor for me getting into cinema was probably, uh, I got to say, takes, um, the layer system. I was about to say, like takes and layer system came out. I was like, eh, whatever. I'm barely ever going to use these. They're not applicable to me. Mm -hmm. But then to someone like you, like that was an absolute must. Like that, like the feature I thought was like most boring was your must have feature. Which is yeah. I mean, it, when you're doing um, twenty shots at at uh, let's say eight K resolution, uh, multiple versions and multiple deliverables, and time is. Uh, you've got a render farm, you've got 
you got to spit out passes for compers. You need a tool that's going to be able to handle all that. So I, I tested it all out and it worked great. And Arnold was a huge part of why I migrated as well, because I was absolutely in love with that renderer back. This was like a year and a half ago, probably. And then I discovered Octane and GPU rendering and it just kind of grew from there. But yeah, those, those things are really what brought me over. And um, a lot of the guys that I brought on that I taught Max to that were originally my guys still use Max now though. They like, they still love it so much that they continue to use 3ds Max at the studios that they're at now, which are kind of spread across uh, the country. But um, yeah, so let's see. Let's see. Um, <laughs> I've got a couple different ones here too. That's a good I'll one. Make sure people know that we're live here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Dan was asking a question about Signal. Um, could you use Signal with nulls to reference other objects? Uh, I'm not entirely sh actually uh, reading that. I'm not entirely sure I know how to follow it. We intentionally in Signal made it so that you can go to the output tab. And in the output tab, you get all of the different variables being fed out. So you could very easily use Expresso to make one signal tag, drive a whole bunch of different things. Like just take signal and then throw it through a range mapper and you can map it onto any other parameter anywhere if you want one tag to drive lots of things. Uh, I don't know if I've ever actually done that workflow ever, but that's why we did that setup. Um, so that's the only way I know how to interpret that question. Um, let's see. Uh, Luca was asking, what is the cleanest way to save a material as a preset uh, with all the textures so that it's nicely organized and easy to get to? Um, that's, that's, a, a, that's a little bit on the technical side, but if you, uh, if you want to show off your, uh, your browser trick, that might be neat. Yeah, as long as, you, uh, as long as you talk it through. Yeah, I'm gonna have to make sure I talk it through pretty well. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me just make sure that uh, I have everything safe. Um, all right. So usually when I'm saving uh, materials, I'm saving them into my content browser. And I already have like my go-to Arnold material libraries here. As you can see, they're completely organized by category and they're locked, uh, which means that I can't actually write to them right now because um, I've chosen to lock them down so they don't accidentally delete or put anything new in there. But if let's say I wanted to do that, if I go into my junk folder, for instance, and I have a shader. Um, let's just say that I have a shader. Let's just make a shader. I'm just going to make a quick shader here in Arnold. And let's just grab an image so that there's an actual image in here. I'll uh, we'll just grab this little sky scene here. I'm going to pipe that into my diffuse, or into my color rather. OK, so now we've got a shader. And let's say that the shader is something that we want to save um, from, from now on. I would recommend creating a, a folder or a library in your content browser. In this case, I'm just going to use this junk folder that I have. And I talk a little bit more about the use of a junk folder in my NAB presentation. Uh, and then you just drag it over into that area. And it's going to save that, save that material and the texture associated with it. It creates a, a text folder for you right off the bat. And you can see I've got some in here. And the new one that I just added uh, was put in there as well. So this is how uh, this gets saved. Now, this is a lib file. This is a, a lib4d file that you can then save uh, and give to anyone. You don't necessarily have to hunt down these textures. It's going to live in this junk folder or in this junk library folder. If you want to extract the um, the uh, textures, then you could do that as well. You could, I think, you could actually copy them or place them somewhere else and and just remap them. But the content browser is a great way to do that. So um, using uh, like the like the way I showed it, um, having your dielectrics and all that sort of thing categorized, and your that gives you the ability to then um, let me just get back in here. Actually, that's my old one. Let me find, ah, here it is. Um, if you break everything up into categories, like this, this one doesn't have any texture maps. That's why there's no text folder in this particular level. I might have one, you know, I think all of these 
actually do not have textures. Okay, this one does. So um, the texture maps are actually stored right there in the libraries that you'll always have them. And you can just share this library with other people that you're working with and they'll be able to load it up the same way. So it's really simple. I hope that answers the question. Yep, Chad's all about the browser. I do love me some content browser. And that comes from me never having that before in uh, 3ds Max or Maya. Uh, let's see. Uh, Zachary was asking that they've been using layers and takes to build out a complex scene. There's a ton of geometry and modifiers, and they're trying to find a way of oh, try and find out if there's a limit to how much I should try and do in one file versus breaking it out into other files. That's a good question. Um, I would say that take it as far as until it becomes more of a pain to deal with the takes <laughs> than it would be to deal with separate scenes. There's going to be like a threshold that you're going to probably cross and you're going to be like opening the file and dealing with the takes is going to be more confusing than just having separate scene files. And that's the point when you should probably split them all out into separate scene files, but use X refs if you can to, to um, make sure that you're not, uh, like if you have an asset that you think is going to span across different shots or different scenes, make it an X ref. And that way when it changes in one place, it changes in all the different scenes and you don't have to worry about updating and diving in and finding that asset and making sure it's got the right material and like all that crap. Yeah. I'd probably be, I, if I, if we worked as a team on like production, I would, there's so many tools I would suddenly have a big use for, but like, I know that, like they came out with X refs and they were very basic. And then uh, the next version of Cinema came out and they added a lot of features. And I think they've continued to make tweaks and tweaks, tweak, you know, more and more tweaks to it. So I don't even know where it's at really these days. Uh, because once again, this, that's like across multiple people on a team workflow. That's not really something I've ever had to deal with. So just another, another one of those organizational tools that, you know, was a must have for you and not that big of a deal for me. Yeah. I think it, it's, if you're not doing that, if you're not doing production, I imagine there's probably a lot of features that are just like, meh, but. Heck, even you, team render is like, yeah, I don't have a specific use for that. Like I'm right. not really rendering. Well, there's, I mean, there's so many different ways to use Cinema 4D too that you technically could still do production and not touch takes, although I don't recommend it, but um, you could have a bunch of different scene files and, it would be fine, but it would probably get really hairy when a project gets complex. You definitely are going to want that. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. We've got uh, we got one from Carlo, and they're Carlo. saying that um, that he would love to hear recommendations from us as industry people uh, because they're about to transition to PC. Uh, he's upgraded his old Mac Pro and would love to hear how, what setup nerds like <laughs> them to try and get get in the first PC, and you nerds are definitely like, nerds be. like us. I love that. I mean, I'll start. I'll start this one out. We've we've talked about uh, some of our hardware before, and actually, if you're interested, we have a an about page on Grayscale Gorilla, and on that page, uh, I think if you scroll down, you get a whole bunch of like hardware recommendations. Where I think you and Nick are like talking about cameras and all of your favorite stuff, but we each have like the the computers, the hardware that we're working off of listed there. So you can see exactly what we have on the page. Um, but for me, I got a, um, I got the new Razer, which is just a laptop company. And I, I don't know anything about hardware, nothing super specifically, very layman. So I just went on to some of the different Slack channels and I asked for recommendations from people who knew what they're talking about. And some people really like that one. And it's just, I always work off of like a really kick-ass laptop. So and it's worked out really well for me. I, I still mostly just use it for like video games and whatnot. I'm not. Right. I'm still doing all of my work off of my Mac laptop, my my Mac Retina. So that's yeah, me. But that doesn't help too much with the PC thing. Moving to PC from a Mac is probably pretty damn scary. I think for a lot of people. Um, I think that it it it's until you do it. It's like one of those things that it sounds like 
oh my God, it's going to be so terrible. It's going to be so different. And I've talked to so many people that made the switch and they're like, it's really not that much different. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, the hardest part is probably figuring out your hardware because it is daunting. It's, it's like, there's so many options. It sounds also technical and it sounds so scary. And like, am I going to have to like get a soldering iron? Like what, what is that? Well, like, what do I do? So I always tell people, you can get as nitty gritty into it as you want to be, or you can be completely, you can just not do that at all and find a place that sells you a pre-made machine with a warranty and it just comes in the mail. So it's really about what do you want to learn? Do you want to learn the ins and outs of building your own machine? Do you want to, if that's the case, then go on PC part picker and like start messing around with different builds and talk to people about what, they recommend what your friends are using and what they like. If you don't want to build your own, then there's plenty of options where you can go and you can find a company like um, I use ABA Direct. There's another one called Media Workstations, Box uh, Technologies. These are all like workstation class uh, manufacturers that will sell you a pre built machine with a warranty. You don't have to do anything that just shows up. You plug it in and you're good to go. So it all depends on what your level of commitment is. And if you're at a company, um, they often will opt for a pre-built solution because they don't have, they don't want to pay their IT people to put together computers. They want them to maintain computers. So they're probably going to want that, that warranty and that guarantee that if it breaks, that somebody's going to fix it, which is why a lot of studios will go with like Dell or HP or box or media workstations or something like that, where it's an all in one kind of solution, very much like a Mac where you just go there, you tell them what you need and they put it together for you. So, I would recommend if it's your first PC to maybe do that unless you're really looking to start building PCs as a hobby or you're interested in it. Um, I would go with a pre-built, pre-made solution uh, and really try to balance your performance to your budget. Like look at what you kind of money you have to spend and put the money where it counts in terms of the work that you do. Like, what are you doing? Are you doing like CPU rendering, GP rendering, a lot of comping? Uh, okay, well, um, there'll be different configurations that you'll want to build based on based on your needs. So there's not a um, there's not a uh, magic solution, although there are some places like I'm, I'm curious if anybody out there has tried media workstations because I've been looking at their stuff and I think they they make from what i can tell they make some pretty kick-ass machines i just don't know anybody that's tried them yet so i'm, I'm curious to, if anybody out there has tried media workstations um machines hit me in the comments because i really want to know what they're like and if they're any good because it, they have a cool site they got some cool specs they got some pretty powerful looking machines they're not cheap but hey i mean that's what you you get what you pay for in my opinion so you want cheap you want you know, budget PC, build your own and take the risk that goes with that. Uh, if you're counting on this machine to make your living and, and pay your rent and feed your family, then put your money where you, where you need it most, where you're going to make your money. So, um, don't be afraid to get a, a good machine. The, uh, I, I've said this before, but people, I, people are always inclined and maybe not maybe like we got a lot of computer you know, we're all computer people. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably a person who spends a lot of time in front of a computer. And to me, like a lot of people love spending money on stuff like their car, but like you spend so much more time in front of your computer than you do in your car that like it, to me, it's absurd. Like it would be more valuable paying the equivalent amount of money that you do into a car, into a machine for your practical day to day. If your machine is slowing you down at all, there's like no excuse for that to be a bottleneck. Like not only is this where you're spending all of your time, but it's also what's making you your money. Like you're, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, your car is probably not making you money. <laughs> Unless you're not you, Elon Musk gets this all figured out. Wait, wait, what if you're an Uber driver? Yeah. Uber driver slash freelance in 40. I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a good number of people doing that. Lots of people love I'm driving. Sure, Uber. Yeah. Uh, we got a couple of good questions. Um, somebody has a follow up to this hardware question. Okay. Specifically for you, Chad. Mm -hmm. Hypothetically, what would it take for you to switch over to the Apple platform? Uh, to be completely honest, not much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. I actually have always been envious of the Mac platform, just from the OS 
standpoint. Um, I don't come in to work every day excited to see ugly Windows UI. Uh, that doesn't excite me. I Although, again, I don't use Windows because of the way that it looks. I use it because it offers me the chance to do my work that I need to do. Uh, the Mac doesn't do that. So if the Mac were to suddenly offer a workstation that wasn't mind-bogglingly mind -bogglingly expensive, uh, and it was, it made sense, I would totally do it. Um, but I don't think they're going to do that. I don't think it's ever going to happen. It's not um, horizon, that's for sure. Yeah, I don't think it's ever going to happen. So, you know, I use whatever allows me to do the best job that I can. And that's a weird thing. Like Mac people, um, I've met so many Mac people that buy a PC and they get into it and they're like, okay, so what apps do I get? And I'm like, you, you don't, dude. Like, <laughs> I don't use Windows for anything more than just launching uh, the programs that we all use, Cinema, Adobe, um, like uh, all that stuff. I don't use Windows Mail. I don't use Windows Twitter program or its Facebook program. The, I am in... I'm, I have three programs that I usually am running every single day on my PC. Cinema 4D, something from the Adobe suite, and Chrome. And like everything I do is through Chrome. Like my mail, my calendar, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram is obviously on my phone, but I also have it up on Chrome. Um, so don't, you, you just got to get over that mindset of like, there aren't, there is no app store for Windows. There is, but it's terrible. And they all, all the apps suck so bad. So just use it as it's meant to be used, which is just an OS to launch your big apps and use Chrome for everything else. Yeah, when I, I think about mine, I've had to do so little with Windows itself. Like I've, it, it's changed over to me that I don't, I'm not downloading the DMG file. I'm downloading the executable file. Like, and then after that, I'm just launching Cinema, or I'm launching like the Steam, the Steam browser, or I'm launching the Blizzard browser, or I'm just using the internet, like Chrome. Like, how much stuff do you do just in like Chrome or your web browser? Like, that's where my apps are. That's where I keep like stuff like Pinterest. That's my app. Right. So yeah, we yeah. do so little to. There's so little to do. The only thing I had to do in Windows was when we were setting up to record podcasts the old style way, I had to keep changing like the way the sound settings worked and everything. And that was a big pain in the butt. I'll say that, but it's the only time I've had to go into the settings at all, really. Right. Yeah. I think that there, there's a, there's misconceptions about PCs that they're um, prone to viruses, which is not, has not been true for 10 years. I think um, the other misconception is that, they're confusing and I don't know, I kind of, I kind of think that all computers are confusing, uh, but you can get as, like I said, as, as, as deep into it as you want to get. Um, I don't know. I just feel like anybody that comes from a Mac, they're used to like having these Mac apps and that changes. Like it, you should already kind of be, changing your mindset into like more of a Google mindset if you're going to PC to start to use like more Google apps for your mail, for your calendar and things like that. Things that are ubiquitous amongst like your phone. Uh, and that's another thing that a lot of people hate too is like they get into the Mac ecosystem and they become really dependent on it because they've got their mail, their iMessage and everything synced. Well, you can still have that experience on a PC. You just got to be more into the Google ecosystem because that's that's the only real kind of way to get that going um, uh, on a PC. I wish Google would come out with an OS and like just everybody we could just not use Windows and it would just be like a Google OS that would, that would run, be, that would that would run cinema and like run all these different apps that we use. That'd be awesome. I guess one of the reasons the transition was so easy for me is I was already in the Google ecosystem. Like I right. signed into Chrome. And I've got my calendar, I've got my mail, I've got all my documents, I've got, like, it was already all, it's all there automatically. Like, my passwords transfer over. It's like, okay, this is super, it couldn't be easier. So everything yeah. that'd be a pain in the butt, it just came along with Chrome. Well, that's why I switched to, um, that's why I switched to Android, too. I was an iPhone guy for so long, but I couldn't use all the cool 
ecosystem features that everybody else was using because I was on an iPhone, but I sat down every day at a PC. And so I had this disconnect between what was happening in my phone and what was happening on my computer. And I realized that I'm like, you know what? Like I use Google for everything. I'm going to try a pure Android. I think I got the Nexus 6P, which is like the purest Android without any of the bullshit um, add-ons. And I got to experience what a lot of, I imagine, Apple people experience when they have an iPhone and a Mac. They You get this like more of a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's more of like a... Um, seamless. All like, in, yeah, yeah, all-inclusive, seamless kind of experience. And I will never go back. I got the um, the Google Pixel, and I absolutely love it for that reason. Just being able to get everything is the same on my phone as on my machine, which is great. I will throw a small gripe out there. Uh, this is simultaneously an amazing feature, and then the most annoying thing until you go fix it. Uh, they made it, you know, a little ways back that the when the iPhone rings, it will ring on your Mac, and you can answer it on your Mac. It'll ring on your iPad. It'll do like. But then, and then on this machine back here, I started logging in. I reformatted, logged in here. So it got to the point where my phone would ring and I would have a ringing sound from four <laughs> different directions. It's like, ah, oh, Jesus, what are we doing? And I have to like stop it on one of them. Yeah. It's super cool. I love being able to like just respond to text messages like straight across the board. It pops up, but there's probably a million ways to do that. I like that it was built in and seamless, but yeah, I use, I, I still, uh, when you're on the Pixel and I'm on the, Google Fi network, so I can I can do the texting via my desktop uh, using Hangouts, and I can answer phone calls and make phone calls and all that sort of thing from my computer. But yeah, I've had that that moment where I'll have my speakers up loud on my computer, and then you know my phone is ringing and it's ringing everywhere. We have a Google Home too, and it rings there as well. So it's like it gets yeah, it gets crazy. Oh, uh, what do we All got right. here? Come on, people, hit us with questions. I've got, uh, I've got a couple. I got, I think I've got enough here to close us out. Actually, wow, if, cool. If we'll That's see awesome, if any other man. good ones pop in. But uh, I won't be able to answer too much on here. It's just not the way my brain works. But Gumbo Inc. is asking about what our R nineteen wish list might be, and mm -hmm. I know you'll have a bunch of stuff because you always have like a huge <laughs> list of things you're thinking about. Um, and I'm going to steal one of them because, I, and I'm saying this not for myself, just like everybody across the world is just everybody hates UV mapping, and I would love to see UV mapping, UV unwrapping figured out and be a lot better. Like, Maxon used to be at the forefront. Cinema 40 used to be at the forefront of, like, with body paint and doing the unwrapping and everything, but everything has kind of moved beyond it to the point where I think almost every single person does their UVs outside of Cinema 4D now. So I just hear everybody say, like, UVs, UVs, UVs. Uh, at this point, like, there's so many third-party renderers that solve the problems. Like, that's all fine. Like, X Particles is doing everything I can think to do with particles. So, um, and we got, you know, there's a lot There's a lot of plugins that are solving a lot of the problems that I would think were big holes. Um, I always like things being built in, like, whenever possible. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. It's, it's hard for me. Like, and especially since I don't jump from app to app to app, I don't know theoretically a lot of things that were missing but that would be that's a big one for everybody across the board but i'm sure you get a whole list of things you'd love to see dude where do i start where do i even start no nah, it's not really that bad uh, i do agree i'll plus one your uv um request uh i'll add triplanar mapping to that which might negate a lot of the uv issues to begin with uh and yeah. if you don't know what triplanar mapping is google it because it's the best thing ever. The one sentence uh, version of tri planar mapping, which I haven't used, but Chad talks about so much. It's like cubic mapping, but the edges blend together really nicely. Yep. And that, that kind of makes a lot of the issues that if you're just quickly banging something out, like you don't even need to UV it, but yeah, yes, you do. We do need better UV tools. We need a multi-threaded MoGraph. Uh, I want to be able to have 20,000 clones without seeing a speed hit. Yes, that would be um, amazing. I want viewport 2.0. I want viewport speeds to be uh, incredibly faster. I want to get uh, good frames per second on heavy scenes with a ton of MoGraph stuff going on. Um, uh, I'd like to see better modeling tools. Um, I'd like to see... 
I know I, I'm actually I, that's something I would be curious about. Like so many, like I know that like everybody loved Rhino, and then there's uh, what's that? I'm, what, what's the main modeling one? I know a lot of people love Max's modeling tools, but what's the, mm-hmm. that modeling specific? Moto? Yeah, Moto. Everybody always talks about Moto for modeling. And like I, I haven't used much outside of cinema, but like I know... Okay, I, actually, I, I'm going to put one on the list. And it's like the biggest thing for me. I want a kick-ass bool tool. I want to be able to do Boolean operations on objects so we get like nice, super clean edges and... It can well, just then, smoothly run and not take a million years to calculate. Like bools are so like if you take if you take any object and put in a bool and animate them passing through each other, you're going to get a couple of dead frames in there. And it's just right. like it makes it so you can't you cannot animate a bool. No, and most people I I, eh, I think anybody that's doing like really heavy Boolean hard surface modeling, they're using MOI or Fusion 360 or something like that. But uh, I mean, yeah, it would be nice to have some of that functionality in cinema, but more than anything, I think we need more speed, uh, more multi-threading down to as much of the core as possible. I think we need a, 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 a continued deep connection to Houdini. I think we're seeing a ton of people starting to dive into Houdini for really complex stuff, but want to be able to still render and output through cinema. And right now it's, it, you can do it through the Houdini uh, engine, but it's not super fast. And it could, if that was faster and if they could figure out some cool conduit that was much quicker, then I think a lot of people would really love that or just make, like I said, make MoGraph multi-threaded to, to its core, and that might solve a lot of people from wanting to go to Houdini to begin with. But um, I'd also like to see, um, let's see what else is there. You know, I would love I would love some of the cloth features to be implemented into soft body, because soft body and rigid body just work together. Like it's, it's like, okay, that's kind of like the unified uh, system. Unified. So if they, like get rid of cloth, but then take, the cloth stuff and put it into the soft body so you can like belt soft body onto a character easily like that would be so amazing like i recently kind of discovered that that you can use springs to belt a point on which is great for splines but you can't do that on a whole like series of points that just doesn't work that would be amazing yeah i think the like we're, we're asking for weird. i get very specific i need this tiny specific thing in the thing they've already got no they need to make cloth faster or get rid of it and call it because that was one thing that confused me when I started using cinema. I started messing around with cloth. I'm like, man, this thing sucks. And then there, somebody, I think you were like, no, don't use that. Use soft bodies. And I'm like, well, why even have the cloth object then? Like, why, yeah. why is that even a thing? Like, just improve the overall speed of soft bodies. Call it cloth. Call it whatever, and and make it unified. Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, I mean, I think X Particles does a pretty good job at being. At, at what it does. I would like to see uh, a, the latest version of Thinking Particles, the Thinking Particles that is used in 3ds Max and Maya. I would like to see that brought into cinema someday because I just think it's super powerful. But then again, a lot of those people are just going to move to Houdini and and do it in Houdini. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, there's lots of, lots of things like that. Um, I w- you know what I wish they would do? I wish they would stop. I wish they would stop messing around with rendering and just focus on the stuff that we just talked about. Because, <laughs> like, I, I think rendering is covered. Like rendering, we've got so many third-party renderers out there covering those bases and developing uh, for that. That I would rather see some really fundamental speed enhancements done to the core app so that so that I can continue to use it as my everyday and it, it's not bogging down all the time. I anyway, would, uh, I would second that. What else we got? We've got, uh, here's a quick one. I don't think we'll spend long and I have a different question I want to close out on. So Steven was asking if we have any favorite hidden gem utility apps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, I'll throw you, this you out. Go like, first. When comes, yeah, when, when it comes uh, for me, I, I mostly think about that along the lines of like Chrome extensions or just like web browser extensions. And my two must-haves on that are really straightforward. Um, 
One of them is just, I, I use Pinterest quite a bit for various things. It's just like, if I see a cool image, like I spend a lot of time on Reddit and whatnot. If I see a cool image, it's like, oh, I want to save that into a particular category. So a little Pinterest button, super useful there. Uh, and then the other one, I just love to the point where I like, I use it so much, I forget that it's an add-on I added. And it's just called Hover Zoom. And it makes it so that if you mouse over an image on a web page and it links to like a bigger version of the image, it'll just, when you mouse over it, it'll make it zoom up full size. Like if you're, cool. if you're just surfing things like uh, Pinterest or on Reddit, I so rarely have to click any link. I can just mouse over everything and see it pop open. Use it all the freaking time. Hmm. That's a good one. I have to link that one. I will. Um, I have a ton. Um, it's easier. I'm, I'll just kind of show you as I go. If you're new to PC, then I have a tutorial on our YouTube channel about my favorite top five Windows utilities. But um, let me just minimize all this stuff. Okay, so number one, um, I've got this little uh, feature down here that's showing my core temperatures. These are the temperatures of all, all the cores on my machine. And that's just using, uh, I think it's called Core Temp or Core, yeah, Core Temp. So it's a desktop app that when you have it up, it actually will show you the stats of all your cores, making sure that you're not overheating. And it puts this nice little thing in your system tray so that you can see what's going on. <laughs> the other must have is ShareX, which is a screenshot um, tool that I use every single day. I do a lot of screenshots. Uh, and that is I'll, gonna, I'll give you like a shortcut to do screenshots because yes. that, that, that snippet tool or whatever it is is so clunky. Oh, it's super clunky. I have it set to you can make your own shortcut. Uh, mine's just set to control minus on my um, keyboard. So I, I guess I would probably set mine the same way I do it on. I, I would do that my Mac way. Can you can you copy the clipboard with it? Yeah. So not only can uh, you, there you go. it copies to the clipboard or you can actually I have mine set to automatically upload to my Google Drive. So um, ah. and then it, it, puts, it, puts, it puts the URL in your clipboard to the Google Drive link so you don't like have to, you know, upload it to a chat client or something like that. And you Dude, can that's, do that explains you've got a very robust like Google album thing that you're always that has all this stuff. It's like, wow, Chad really keeps up with putting <laughs> putting stuff up there. But you just make it so you can draw a, a really a lot of it, dude. Yeah. 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 And you, you draw a marquee over it. You've got it. So you can like annotate with this. I use this a lot when I'm like uh, giving feedback, like, you know, brighten this up and, you know, you can like. Yeah, put so Chad just drew on his desktop and. Yeah, and sorry. I'm drawing, I'm annotating. And then you can just screenshot the whole thing like this and it outputs it to my screenshot folder, but also makes a copy um, to my Google Drive. So now if I were to hit paste in a chat application, in our case, um, I will put it into, well, you get the idea. I would hit control paste and it would, um, it would, it would show up, uh, it would, people could link to it. So ShareX, and it, ShareX also can do, um, you can do screen record GIFs. So if you've ever seen me like post a GIF of me showing how something is done, that's how I'm doing it. I'm literally making uh, a little GIF using ShareX, and right. it, it's awesome. That's probably my my everyday thing. That's pretty. Uh -huh. That is. I'm going to have to get that because that seems super useful. Like I, oh, I yeah. actually have. I have one. I have one app to capture GIFs. I have one app to. Well, I, you have the built-in screenshot stuff, and like, yeah, that seems pretty good. And yeah, the you can. Was like a pain in the butt. Yeah, that thing is. Not good. And you can do capture by it. It does. I don't know if you noticed when I was running um, the screen thing, but it will. Um, am I still? Oh, no, I'm not. You're screen. back. It's you. Um, yeah. If I it'll actually snap to the application, too. So like if I uh, if I open up right now, I've got you're seeing the infinite little stream that we've got going on here. But if I just initialize ShareX and I just kind of mouse over something, oh, okay. it, it snaps the window to that to that size. Oh yeah, um, and I, I like how it's even snapping to the interior of the window. It's not even showing like the like little task bar -y description. I guess it depends where you mouse over, so even better. Yeah, wow, that's can, a really smart application. Yeah, and then it's got this little magnified um, view so that you can get like really pixel accurate with your, um, with your capture. Like if I just wanted to capture just that, I could do that really easily. I wonder if that is on Mac as well. I'm just curious. 
I don't know. I I'm use it. Okay. I oh, use no. it oh, no. I just it, it, I just went to their website and download automatically downloaded the EXE. So I'm guessing they're not on Mac. Yeah, but they update it pretty frequently. Frequently, and um, if you if you're on PC and you haven't checked that one out, that's a that's a definite must have. I'm trying to think of other must have I might have. Um, all the Chrome extensions that I use are kind of GSG related. They're probably not going to be super useful for anyone else out there. I do use uh, LastPass for all my passwords, um, which is really useful. Uh, I highly recommend using that one or one of the other ones out there. There's, I think there's like two or three of them out there because I have like a bajillion passwords and user accounts on these different sites and it makes it a lot easier if you just sign in one place and then the app signs in for you. Um, All right, yeah. I've got one last question I thought would be fun to close out on. Sweet. Um, and Josh was asking what our dream projects might be and why. Hmm. Interesting. So I, I'll let you think about it because I was already thinking about it, and I have I have two answers. Um, one of them is kind of a hobby, like it's a hobby thing for me, and like I don't I don't want it to be more than a hobby, but I really like jumping into Unity and creating just video game stuff. Like, but what's kind of fun about this is I don't have a dream project to work in there. I just when I'm in the mood to work in Unity and tinker around, I just love the process. Like I don't expect to ever publish anything, but I have started like three different like game projects and they're just they're just so much fun to like learn and tinker and it's such a great way of learning like programming because when you're in a video game engine, you're getting constant instant feedback where you're like, "Hey, look, I'm I followed a tutorial and I've now got like a sphere, I am a sphere running around on some geometry that I imported from Cinema 4D, and now it's shooting a gun, and now it's hitting objects, and now it's doing this, and every time you add a line of code, you're like, oh, I want it to spawn a new sphere every 10 seconds, and then that sphere is gonna be this heavy, and then it's gonna knock my, it, everything you do is like instant feedback, and so much fun. It's one of the most fun ways of learning that, uh, that I've really ever experienced. Um, and I mean, it's, it's impractical to do anything big. And whenever I've talked to other people about video game projects, I'm like the best one to do code. <laughs> and like, that's not, that shouldn't be the case. Like I'm, I'm dangerous when it comes to code, but like, I'm not good at it. Um, but, but that's my, that's my fun one. And I'll let you do one, but then I have a follow up for a more practical one. Uh, I don't know. I guess my dream project for me would be, um, I don't know. That's a tough one. Any any project where uh, I can do the the like the creative aspect is up to me, and the execution is up to me, and I can hire if I was able. Like the dream project with me would be like somebody lets me do whatever I want. Maybe it benefits someone or something like a, a charity or something, and there's enough budget to hire all my most talented friends. Like that would be a dream project. Oh, that'd if, be crazy. If I could do that, like if somebody were to be like, hey, why don't you um, make a short and it's going to benefit this foundation or something and we have, uh, I don't know, a lot of money to give you to hire all of your favorite best people and then to I make could, the best project. Possible. Yeah, like that would be, that would be awesome. Like That'd be dream. crazy. That's that's too open-ended to me. I couldn't, I couldn't handle that. Yeah, it'd be cool just to like bring in like all my friends that are like insanely talented and like use have them do what they're really good at for the project and then just me just kind of like directing it or whatever and that'd be fun be a lot of fun to do that the uh and I, this is a super duper far away tease i guess for everybody listening but my next dream project the practical one is would actually be working on transform 2.0 because I've got so many ideas for transform and where it's going to go. And like, it's going to be rewritten from the ground up with all these cool new features. And I think it's going to be amazing. It's a long ways away. And I could tease anything specific because who knows what will be in there, but man, like that, that is like when I, you know, I started at Grayscale Gorilla, we were working on city kit and we made city kit. And then after we did city kit, we started working on, actually we were working on a whole suite of tools. And then we started focusing in on this one called transform and the transform kind of became so big, it gobbled up all the other ones. 
Um, but like, I, I, to me, that's like my baby. Like I love transform. Like it was such a learning process is when I started learning some Python, it was just like, Hey, it, it, you know, we were able to, my brother came in and he helped out and that's how we were able to like make it in the plugin menu and do a whole bunch of things. And that's why, you know, why we eventually hired him. So there is a really cool project. And then like us sitting around on launch day, like launching that it was just such an experience. It was so cool. And even as we were launching it, I had all these ideas for where I wanted it to go and things I wanted to be able to do with it. And We've got so many different plugins that we have to update at Grayscale Driller. We're, we're working on all these different things. So like I'm waiting, like like it's such a big thing for me, like waiting for Transform to come back around so we can really dive into it and, and get it going. But but that's we have literally not even started working on it. So that is a far, far away tease. That's my dream project. So it will happen. I just don't know when. That can become a reality. Make your dreams come true. Hello? You there still? Yeah. Oh. oh yeah, yeah. You Why don't you? You uh, went silent. Um, I don't. I'm sorry. I started looking at the chat to see if there's uh, <laughs> like, other responses. Did I lose them? Um, yeah. I mean, I, practical. You want, is that what you're looking for? Like a practical? Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Now? I just, I just had two things in mind. And one, uh, my my video game one is just kind of fun. It's not like an actual practical one. So you don't need. You don't. I'm need kind another. of living the dream right now. I mean, I'm, I'm. I feel like I'm right now. Um, embarking on a really large project which yes. started that you can't really talk some about of it out and it's one of those things that i just absolutely love doing so it, it it's been a joy to be able to do it um and learn more and and expand my knowledge in that area and uh yeah i'm kind of doing my favorite thing right now and um we'll have more on that soon hopefully but yeah. yeah, man, this is great, man. This is a cool podcast. I liked, uh, yeah, these again, to like, to you know, GSG Connect, if you're a Grayscale Gorilla customer, you have access to the Slack channel called GSG Connect, which is where all of the people are that are chatting with us and giving us these questions. They're the uh, only ones who get the link to the live version. Yes, it's it was an exclusive link to them. Um, so, yeah, all you have to do is buy something, and you'll get into this as well. In fact, it's, it's growing like crazy. I think the... Uh, Last time I checked, we had, let me check here. I think we have like over 600 people in there. Um, 678 members already. Uh, all people in motion design, different levels of, uh, in their career, talking about stuff. It's a cool place to hang out. Um, anything else? Did You said you had one question that you wanted to end on. Was that, that the question? That was, that was at the Dream okay. Project. But that was cool. Cool. Well, thanks everybody for, for uh, coming in and, and chatting with us. And if you're just listening uh, in your car, at home, at work, wherever, thanks for uh, tuning in. As always, if you, if you like what you're here, give us a good review, give us a thumbs up, subscribe, all that, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we do we are, comment. Yes, please leave comments. Those are always uh, good to, good to see. We are, we're also on Google play now too. So if you're, an Android person, or if you just like listening to stuff there instead of iTunes, you can check us out on Google Play now. Or the and best then, uh, place yeah, and a bunch really... of those in a bunch of those places, we'll have our podcast notes with links to things like Share X and the different things we were talking about. Yeah, be sure to check those out. Uh, and you can see us if you want to see what we look like and what we're doing. And I did a few screen shares on this, so you you might want to check out our YouTube channel, uh, which is where you'll actually see the podcast. Oh, and then one last thing, since we were getting some of those questions, uh, keep in mind, uh, I guess we'll be wrapping it up soon for the season, but uh, we do Ask GSGs on, uh, on Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Central Time, where for two hours... I do this type of thing, but it's all Cinema 4D questions. And I just take questions, and we try and recreate stuff and, and make it. So that's always super fun. So go check that out sometime. Just go to, just search Ask GSG, and you'll, you'll find the link to it. Cool, cool. All right. Well, with that, um, that is going to do it for us. Have yourselves a great week, and we'll see you on the next podcast. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.